Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unity Fundamentals 101, Week 3, with your lead instructor, Mr. Nelson LaKay. Nelson. Hey. Hey. Also joining us tonight, the ever-so-amazing TA and, well, sometimes instructor, Gavin Whitlock. Hello. Hey, all right. And myself, Jason Busby. All right. Okay, enough with the crowd. Let's get going. So what do we have lined up tonight, Nelson? We've got several things. Well, today we're we're going to be wrapping up what we were were shooting for last week, and um, we're going to be going ahead and actually using what we kind of started putting together last week to make well a game. Yeah, sounds great. All right, that's fantastic. And for those of you that may have missed last week and you've not yet had an opportunity to watch the video, it is important to note that we have added one more week to the Unity One Hundred and One class. We. Need at the time. That's actually so, one fewer week than I thought we were having anyway, so it all pans out in the wash. Oh, because you were thinking it was an eight-week class? Yeah, I thought we'd made them all eight. <laughs> oh, I, I totally agree. It's, I think it's worth... Um, I, I think it's worth... I'm, I'm sorry, what Florham just said over on BuzzNet kind of cracked me up. Your intro announcement kind of woke me up. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let, let, let's get some unity up. Let's talk about where we ended up last Thursday. Alrighty. Um, Ooh, and I need to upload that asset file and put a link over there for every point. Yes, that might be helpful. Yes, a good thing. Have you still got your text file checklist that you made last week? Yes. To hand. Yep, that's what we're using. I was going to because you should point out where we are then. Okay, so where we left off last week is we have a basic game set up, and when we play it, we have some states that we can go through. So it's just basically a kind of quick little structure of our simple game. Uh, you know, we talked about some fun stuff with uh, scripts and some other fun stuff with input handling and some conceptual stuff with actually dealing with, um, well, with game states. Um, there were a few questions that came in uh, before class, and I want to go ahead and address some of them. Uh, one of them was, when you have different C, uh, C Sharp files in VB for testing, can you simply disable to run one file? How do I remove the .cs? Actually, I th uh, now I'm at a loss actually as to what the question was. I think what he means is, well, Visual Studio obviously not Visual Basic. And uh, basically if you have um, two copies of the same file that are like different versions if you not as if you were doing version control and had two branches but you've, you're not doing that obviously you've just got two copies of the same class it's going to give you a confliction error is that what you were asking Hank? confliction isn't a word either yeah but you know I make up words all the time so I think you're allowed to from time to time Dimple, was that you that asked the question? I don't know whose username is whose real name. Ah, right, cool. <clears throat> yeah, that is what he was asking then. I did put the link, by the way, over in BuzzNet. So it just kind of blended in with stuff. But uh, make sure to grab those assets if you're wanting to follow along. And I know everyone wants to follow along tonight. So grab it, download it. They're the most exciting assets you've ever seen, I think. Um, Gavin worked on them for about 16 seconds. <laughs> um, so I'm still kind of confused. Uh, different CS files in Visual Studio for testing. Can you disable to run one file? I, I still don't quite understand. If you okay, have... So you've got, you've got a file called program.cs. And then you make another class called program.cs. Okay. And then you'll get an error back saying... Yes. Oh, you've got two. How do you disable one of them? Uh, well, you really can't. Um, you can change the extension, like you mentioned, to something that isn't .cs. Um, and that's really the only way you'll be able to do that. Well, I, my suggestion would be out. to... Uh, yeah, comment it out. Uh, in Unity project file, what is the .exe that bring up the pro project in Unity? Uh, there isn't uh, actually an .exe. 
file, what you'll find is your Unity project is the folder structure. Right, like we discussed before. Go ahead um, you need to, if you just double click on a scene that you've saved, it will open Unity and it will open that scene. Right. To actually get an executable that you can play, uh, that's a little bit uh, out of scope for right now, but I should just show people it anyway if they're curious. If you hit Control B uh, and add in the scene you want to add to the build, select PC and Mac standalone, what you can do is hit the build button. And that'll open up a nice little save dialog. What I'm going to do by convention is I always create a folder called build where I place my executable that I build out to. So I can call this build and hit enter. Now what this is going to do is it's actually going to go out and create an executable for me, build.exe, which is the redistributable package for your game. So now when I click on this, we're now playing the game outside of Unity. But we'll be covering that, um, well actually you can cover that again just at the end when you wrap up this. Yeah. Um, da, da, da. Is the project folder just for C-sharp stuff? No, the project folder is for all of your assets. Now, a C-sharp script is an asset, as well as your FBX models, prefabs, and materials, and scenes, and all that stuff. fun stuff. Uh, in Unity, there is no project save as. Can we duplicate a project simply by copying the project folder and renaming it? Yes. If you want to duplicate a Unity project, copy it and rename it. Um, where we left off last week, when our game us played, we can hit enter to win, enter again to restart, rinse, repeat, but if I had space to lose and hit space again to restart the game, I instantly lose again. Um, it shouldn't really be like that. Um, if I hit space, I lose, and then I'm... Um, Did you make sure that you used um, on key down, not on key? I think I... Yeah. I'm talking to whoever asked the question. I can't find it. I'm Ty. Because there are, when it comes to keyboard <clears throat> buttons, there are three. There are get key down, get key up, and get key. Get key down and get key up do, um, literally, they get key down is fired once on the frame when the, it's just been pressed down. Similarly with get key up, but for when you release it. Get key is essentially a boolean is the key down or up. So if that gets checked every frame. Cool. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Does the build include an option for an install like the big games? I'm not aware of uh, Unity having any built-in installer. Then again, you can use any installer you wish, because an installer, all that does is it copies folders and sets up shortcuts. There's nothing special or magical about what an installer actually is, or an uninstaller actually is. So that's out of the scope of Unity itself. Doesn't That's why virtually every game that was ever put to market between about the beginning of this century and Steam coming online all have install shield. In fact, m many still do. You know, the, the right. installers that you see will often be the same installers. Mm -hmm. Usually usually that install shield one. Yeah, um, they're... From a third-party company, and that will deal with its own security issues and those sorts of things. Yeah, there, there are very few, you know, big installers in the world, and everybody uses them. It, that is a very much an example of... Um, you know, having to reinvent the wheel at a very detailed level. Mm. But and as as, as Les Paul said, install shield costs a fortune. But that's because it goes up way over and above just simply installing a, a, a game for you. Yeah, and it's it's a commercial package that has just been around for a long time. A lot of people trust it as well. I mean, commercial software costs money. <laughs> But there are always going to be an open source alternative, especially for something that as simple as an installer. Cool. So, so yeah. So let's go ahead and jump right in and start writing, or not writing code. Let's start 
well, making a Getting game. Getting stuck in. Uh, go ahead and hit participate, whether or not you want to participate, because you all are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> that was by way of being a joke. If you're not participating, please do not press participate. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and reset everybody's ready button, and we're going to get started. Okay, so we're going to start with backgrounds. So the first thing that I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to back up. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import all of the assets that you should have gotten through the assets.zip, and I'm going to set some settings on them so we do not forget. Um, so here I have open the assets folder that you should have been provided. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the FBXs. So all of the FBXs. I'm going to create a new folder inside of my project called Meshes. Then I'm going to simply click and drag all these FBXs into Meshes. Then I'm going to click and drag the simple ship TGA into Textures. So you should have a folder that looks like this. Uh, is it as simple as copying week two folder to a week three folder? Yep, you can do that. That's what I did. Okay, so now you should have all of your meshes and textures added. Go ahead and hit one more minute if you do not have these added because we will be setting some properties on them that are very, very important for you to know. And if there's a substantial amount of people who haven't got this set up yet, then I'll wait. And it looks like there is a substantial amount of people who haven't got the setup yet, so I will wait. So let me get this straight. You're going to wait because there's a substantial number of people who haven't got this yet. Yes. Good. I just wanted to make sure I clarified that. Well, if there's only going to be silence, I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. Okay. And we're back. So, Gavin. Uh, you, Gavin. <laughs> Thanks for that detailed introduction. <laughs> yeah. We've just brought in some assets, and the, tech, the TGA file that we brought in is a texture. Now, it's an image format, and anyone who's new may not be clear on there is a difference between textures and materials. Materials, well, no, textures are what you think of as an image. They are a, a, a a representation of a picture. A material has more than that. As part of it, it will usually have, well, it will have zero to many uh, textures associated with it. But it will also have things like an overall color tint that you can apply and various other settings that we don't need to get into right at this second. But um, right. just to clarify, just, just, well, I wanted to point up that the fact that there is a difference. They're not just two different um, two different ways of talking about the same thing. Right. Um, and yes, they are shade. Uh, material is analogous to a shader for any of you. Yeah. So basically, it, it, material is the way in which you describe what color a particular pixel may be on a mesh, and then a texture can be used with a material that knows about textures to make the pixels on that mesh appear as if they were from that texture. So pretty much what Gav said. So anyway, so now that we've jumped, dumped the stuff in, we are not going to be using the materials that were imported. So you notice, a lot of people notice that there was a materials folder created. We're going to delete that. So click on that, hit delete, hit enter. Make those go away. Um, and then get repainting. Oh, well, eh. See, this is what I'm talking about. Like, you'll randomly get an internal Unity error in your console yeah. window. And unless it dies, not, it just crashes and dies, you shouldn't have any problems. But anyway. Always a good point to say yeah. if that happens yeah. as well. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click on all of these meshes and select all of them, and we're going to change some of their settings, their import settings, because remember, these are all meshes. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck import materials. We don't want to import the materials from the FBX files. FBX, X, the FBX files can contain materials, but we're going to be defining our own, so I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that. 
the second thing is we're not going to be pulling in any animations. Although I don't think any of these meshes do have animations on them, regardless, there's no point to even worry about any of those settings. Then I'm going to go ahead and hit apply. Now that's an important thing to note. When working with the edit or the import settings of any thing that you might import, you'll have this apply button down here. And if you don't hit it, then, well, your settings, your changes won't be applied. And, well, nothing Unity will, happen. will warn you about this if you make a change to a sitting. Um, right. But you can show, show it with the next sitting you make and then try and move away. You'll get a pop-up saying, hey, you didn't apply this. Are you sure? Right. So, for example, uh, everybody click on player ship. Now, the, most, the, the thing that's going to change between all of these meshes is going to be their scale factor. And the scale factor is basically how um, the import from the external application that was modeled in gets reconciled with the, um, the way that Unity deals with dimensions. And we have, because we've been working with these models, um, we do have a particular set of scale factors already in mind for use. So if you click on the ship, give it a scale factor of 0.5. And then now we'll demonstrate what Gavin was talking about before. I've changed a setting within the import settings, but if I try to click off, I get an unapplied import settings dialog. It says unapplied import settings for blah, blah, blah. Do you want to apply them or revert them? Now, obviously, I clicked off by mistake, and I do want to apply them, so I'll just hit the apply, and that's analogous to if I had just hit the apply button down here. Do you just want to run through exactly what you changed on those, on all of them again? Yeah, the only thing I changed on every one of these meshes was I changed their uh, import materials. I unchecked it. Then I said under their animations to not import any of the animations. Okay, so playership is going to have a scale factor of 0.5. The quad section is going to have a scale factor of 1. So quad section has a scale factor of 1. The simple ship, which I don't know how that got in here, uh, is actually going to be deleted. Yeah, we don't. Um... <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and delete the simple ship. I must have accidentally uh, brought that into the assets folder on accident. Hmm, accidentally on accident. <laughs> Um, so then I'm going to jump into the Starfield Cylinder, and I'm going to give him an, a scale factor of 1. And apply that. So I'm going to reset everybody's ready check, and go ahead and hit ready if you have all of these settings set. Go ahead and hit one more minute if you need one more minute. Uh, the quad section is going to have a scale factor of 1, as well as the Starfield Cylinder. And as the more nosy amongst you will have immediately, when Nelson said, why is that in there? That shouldn't have been in there. Will have gone poking around in the simple ship model. Um, you'll see that it's the same as the player ship, except that it is pointing straight upwards into the air. <coughs> and uh, that's how it was... I've just... Uh, I rotated it in another program to get it to point in the direction we wanted to point in. Right, because of an, uh, an aspect of unity, um, how it determines well, upness. Yes, that was the uh, player ship that went with the uh, win, lose, and start screens that we brought in. And it was for a game where it needed to be pointing upwards. So it had been built in that direction. So anyone not got those settings done yet? Alrighty, so uh, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start playing around with the background now. So the way the background is going to work, it's going to be fairly interesting. Um, this is for this is just going to be the first pass of this game to get something kind of working and to show you guys a, an interesting technique for dealing with star fields. What I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to take this star field cylinder and I'm going to bring it over into the hierarchy. So notice how I click 
and drag over into the hierarchy. So now I have the Starfield cylinder in here. I'm just going to frame up on it by hitting F. Now there are a few things that I want to do to the position of this Starfield cylinder um, that ma should make total sense. For the rotation, I want it to be 0, 0, 0. And for the scale, I want it to be 100, 100, 200. So these aren't, necess these aren't really that arbitrary of numbers. I just wanted a big cylinder. Now, can anybody tell me what's interesting about this cylinder compared to a cylinder that you might get if you had clicked on Game Object, Create Other, and Cylinder? In fact, I'm going to go ahead and create that right then and scale it up just so people can see what the difference is between the two. There's a very important difference between these two things. Well, I've got a few people with the uh, correct answer, although I think I may have referred to it in last week's lesson. So, huh. either way, well remembered or well known. Or we just have a lot of modelers in here. Yeah. Um, like people were saying, the normals are inverted. I'm not going to get into a big discussion about um, uh, 3D math and how meshes work, but think about a normal as a vector that determines which direction a particular face is pointing, or a particular vertex is pointing. Um, and in this case, by inverting the normals, we've essentially created a, or Gavin created, a cylinder that we can jump inside of and see the walls of, because these polygons are facing the opposite direction than if we had used the built-in Unity cylinder object. So to create this cylinder, all what that was really need, needed to be done was to create a cylinder in you know, a 3D application and invert the normals. Okay, so uh, now that I have the first star field selected, I'm going to go ahead and create a material for it. And remember, material is the shader, or more specifically, a material determines what color a specific pixel or vertex, if it's a vertex shader, um, a mesh will be. And remember, everything in, in all computer graphics is made up by you know, colors of pixels, and our materials are going to determine that by whatever algorithm that we decide to use with the materials. But you'll notice we don't have to really get into a lot of crazy math, because there's a very nice set of defaults we can use with Unity. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder called Materials. Within this folder, I'm going to create a material. And I'm going to call it Starfield. Now, this material is select, uh, basically a material in Unity is two things. So I kind of lied. Um, typically, I mean, you can think of a material just as a shader. But in Unity, when you click on a material within your inspector, you'll be able to choose two things. You'll be able to choose the shader that you want to use. And notice how we have a lot of really fun shaders to play with. Um, everything from, you know, we have transparent shaders, we have uh, shaders that support uh, bump maps, and, uh, and so on. And we're just going to be using the default diffuse shader. That's pretty much the simplest shader that you can get. And pretty much what a diffuse shader is going to allow us to select is a texture and a base color. And then it's just going to sort of interoperate between the two. It's going to what? Interoperate. Interoperate. Inter Inter That's fantastic. It's going yeah. to basically it's going to multiply the main color by the color of each pixel in the texture to give the output. Right. This is literally the most basic thing you can do. It's you're it's, setting yeah. a color. Really, that's it. Um, notice how underneath the shader, shader selection, we have settings. And each of the settings, depending on the shader, is going to be different. So, for example, if I went to a bump diffuse, we'll have a normal map. Um, if I went to something with parallax, we'll have a height map and a normal map and so on. But, of course, we're just going to be using diffuse. And diffuse has two options, or three options. It has the main color, the texture, as well as options for the texture. So for the texture, I'm going to go ahead and hit the select button, and I'm going to jump down to stars and just double click on that, get that set on our star field material. Then I'm going to set its tiling. I'm going to set the tiling to 8 and 8, and those are just numbers that are going to give us a nice look for this particular 
uh, texture being applied to this particular sized um, capsule. Right. And this, uh, again, it's, the way the tiling and offset values work is that if with the standard tiling of one by one, that means that your texture will be stretched, as, as in this case, across the whole inner surface of that cylinder once. Whereas by tiling it eight by eight, you've literally now got eight times smaller in both directions, so 64 times smaller. Um, image and it will repeat uh, over and over mm -hmm. across the image and the offset uh, literally you can play with those but it will be rotating in various uh, angles uh, sort not rotating translating in X and Y uh, the easiest way to see that is just to um, scroll it backwards and forwards and see what happens um, I want to point out that the Starfield texture was imported in last week. The stars texture. Yes, stars. Sorry. Uh, what did I do? Did I set the texture and how? Yeah, I just clicked on the select button underneath the, the, the uh, selected shader on my material, and I just double clicked on stars. Okay, so before I go ahead and pause the video to wait for people to catch up, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how to apply a material. Applying a material, you can do it one of two ways. I can click on the mesh, I can go down to his materials, and I can select Starfield. Alternatively, a nicer way to do it is I can literally grab this shader or this, uh, this material and drag it right onto my scene. And whatever object I'm dragging it onto, it will be applied. Of course, I could also drag it into the hierarchy if I wanted to. But I'm just going to, I'm typically, when I apply a material, I'm just going to click in the project folder, drag it onto the object that I want to apply it to. That seems like the most intuitive way to deal with that. Okay, and you'll notice something interesting about this. Uh, zoom in faster. Oh, never mind. It looks like we got some default lighting in any way. I think what you were trying to show might happen if you went into game mode. Oh, yeah. Let me go ahead I and... I mean, actually, and play it. Let me go ahead and uh, move, rotate my camera around, and then go into game mode. There's a distinct lack of, well, anything. So we'll talk about how to fix that soon. However, I am going to go ahead and reset everybody's ready button. I'm going to open up my material so people can look at the settings. Hit ready if you have the material applied and set up. Hit one more minute if you need one more minute. And there's a few people who need one more minute, so I'm going to go ahead and pause Zoom. Now we're going to be doing something kind of fun. We're going to go ahead and get this uh, Starfield cylinder moving. And what we're going to do is we're going to have two segments on this game, only two segments. And they're going to continuously move and then leapfrog so that we look, it looks like we have a continuous bit of gameplay when in fact we're just standing in place and watching the stars move in front of us. So to do that, we're going to need two segments. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create another two empty game objects. The first game object I'm going to name segment one, and the second game object I'm going to name segment two. I'm going to parent the Starfield cylinder with segment one by clicking on Starfield cylinder and dragging it right on top of segment one. So now the segment one game object has the Starfield cylinder as a child of it. Then I'm going to go ahead and actually delete segment two, because I probably shouldn't have done that yet, because I can do this a lot easier by clicking on segment one and hitting control D. Um, sorry to interrupt. Yes? But the pos segment positions, um, did you not want to zero those out before adding the star fields? Uh, um, that was probably, that's a good point. It's one thing that is easy to forget. In fact, it's good that you did that. That way you can show what the problem is. Right. I, I, right now I have some uh, positioning issues. And you'll notice that 
Okay, so it looks like I just got things back. Basically, what happened was, is my game object, when I created a game object, so I'm just going to create, do, you guys don't have to create this game object, but when I created this game object, it gave it an X, Y, and Z of some arbitrary position, presumably where my camera is pointing at at the moment. And when I parented the Starfield cylinder to the game object that had a non-identity transform, what it did was, is it kind of, it did this weird, uh, um, sort of thing where um, it brought the other game object into kind of a local space relative to the parent game object and things became sort of messy. So to fix that, to resolve that issue, what I did was I made, that, made sure that both segment one and the starfield cylinder are now positioned at zero, 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 which is exactly what I want. So now we can go ahead and click on um, uh, segment one and hit control D. And now I have two segment ones. The second one I'm going to rename to segment two. Now segment two is going to be, be positioned. Remember, position the parent game object. Do not position the child game object. Because if you do not if you position the uh, child without the parent, then the parent's still sitting there at the origin of 000, while the child just got thrown halfway across the world. And obviously that's going to cause a lot of confusion if you ever tr are going to attempt to do any sort of math on do performing transforms for those objects. So make sure that you have segment 2 selected and give it a position of 0, 0, 2000. And of course, that's not an arbitrary decision either, because you'll see that we now have two segments, two starfield cylinders that are placed um, snug up with, against each other. Uh, the first segment is set to zero 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 for both the parent and the child. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit everybody's reset button. So go ahead and hit one more minute or ready, depending on where you are in this project. Uh, the first segment, again, is at zero zero zero. The second segment is at um, zero zero two thousand. Now, yeah, and that's not the star, I didn't move the starfield cylinder to 2000. Notice how the position of the starfield cylinder is still at 000, even though it's obviously not at the origin. That's because the parent transform has decided that it's been moved 2000 in the Z, direct, Z direction. <laughs> and obviously, for those of you who are just trying to cling on to uh, following along and haven't had time to process the numbers given. Well, that 2000 comes about because obviously we've got a scale factor in the Starfield Cylinder of 200 in that direction and it was already 10 units long to start with. 10 times 200 being 2000. Now there are ways of working these things out using uh, Unity to get hold of the bounds of the object but that's beyond uh, this course and um, it, in this case it's just a question of doing some basic maths yourself to find the answers. Well both of your starfield cylinders should be at zero 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 position wise. The go ahead, we're off camera aren't we? No. Go ahead and do it again. We're not. Well I can go ahead and pause. I mean. Oh even if we're. Yeah I was, I was thinking. Yeah well yeah I'm going to go ahead and hit and we're back. So, um, what we're going to go ahead and do now is get the background to actually move. So to do that, we need to be able to reference both segments of our map within code. There's actually a very simple way we can do that. If I open up the Game Manager script, so if I go under scripts, Game Manager, if I add a property for public game object array segments, 
Unity. It's a public field, not uh, a property. Yeah, public field. I wish it was a property, but it's not. So if I go ahead and create this public field, what I can do now is jump back into Unity. Uh, why aren't you just stretching one cylinder as to not have the second one? You will see that in a second. Um, now I'm going to jump into the game manager under the inspector. Now notice how there's a segments option. I can click on this and set the size of the array to 2. After setting the size of the array of 2, I can now select two game objects from within my inspector. So, or I can click and drag. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go ahead and click and drag segment 1 right onto element 0. And I'm going to click and drag segment 2 right onto element 1. Alternatively, if you wanted to use this funky little icon that I still have yet to identify what the real world analog to it is, if you click on button. the button, yeah, this little button thing, I don't know. If you click on that, you'll get this option where you can select from assets or scene. So to do this using that funky little button, uh, you click on scene and then select which game object you wanted to use. So now we have set up an array on our game manager with two elements on it. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Unity to the right and Visual Studio to the left, or the other way around, and um, go ahead and hit reset, everybody's ready, and get this stuff set. Okay, while everybody's doing that, I'm going to add a couple of more fields that we're going to need as well. Um, for what we're going to be doing with the uh, background movement. So what we need in addition to the segments array is a float called background scroll speed. Another float called background jump point. And another float called background jump size. So go ahead and get all of these properties added on game manager. And then in the inspector window, give the background scroll speed, we're going to start off with 100. We're going to make that smaller once we get into the actual game, but for testing purposes, um, that'll be a very easy way to be able to identify if our code is working. For the background jump point, I'm going to do negative 1200 in the Z direction. And for background jump size, I'm going to do positive 4000. Do you want to talk about the uh, the numbers there, just briefly? Well, yeah, the background scroll speed should be straightforward. It's the speed in which the background scrolls. Again, we're going to move this down to a smaller value when we're not done with testing. Background jump point. This is the point in which the background will leapfrog, or a segment will leapfrog forwards. This number was just chosen because the camera's ability to view the background determines uh, when it... It, it, you'll never want to see the actual camera color or the, the clear, the back buffer clear color, which in this case is, is I think, uh, blue. You'll always want to see the background. So by doing negative 1200, what the, the number came from being able to make the background jump forward before the camera can start picking up on seeing or looking into space. And then the background jump size is, de is used to determine, uh, is 4,000, because that's obviously going to be the size of a background that needs to be jumped forward. Yes, two lots of 2,000 in this case. Okay, so go ahead and hit one more minute if you need one more minute. <laughs> Chris has got a great question, doesn't it? Huh. Answer? No. Well, is this a horizontal or vertical shooter? I'm lost. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, flashes. <laughs> cool. That was understandable. Ah, might be a trick. Yep. It's just the numbers in the code, and then make sure that you have the element zero and element one. <clears throat> applied to the segment one and segment two of the segments field. OK, 
came and that point earlier where I um, mentioned about how you can find the, the values for positioning it um, via unity uh, that's actually the point at which I was intending to mention that because for, uh, the jump size obviously needs to be far enough to leapfrog over the other segment and so you can actually set that up in script if you want to go digging around um, the unity reference it's uh, bounds that you need to be looking into the bounds of game objects How did I do the segments thing? Which segments thing? I only have one. Yeah, if you have the size determines how many elements will show up in this field. So if I said size of 10, notice how there's now 10 elements. However, I want a size of 2, which means there's two elements. And if I put in a size of 0, which is the default, there'll be zero elements. Right, zero should be segment one. Remember, this is an array of segments, so it's zero-based numbering for the elements. Right. Um, as far as these being, as far as whether or not these will change, um, the background stuff will be built upon in the future as, uh, as the game starts to progress. Uh, Ty, think about what you've just said. The jump size should be equal to the size of the segments if they're leapfrogging right. No. Uh, no. <laughs> it should be twice the size of the segments because you're not trying to jump from where that segment is to the position of the next segment, which would be the length of one segment. You're trying to leapfrog it, so you need to go two segments worth. Um, as far as a quick peek at the main camera, there's nothing special about the main camera. We're going to be changing the main camera up very shortly here. So don't worry about the main camera quite yet. Here's a question that you can fill time with. Hmm. You can have a rant about that one. Which one? This one. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I pointed out. Should they be public? Because it seems to me that they don't need to be changed. And, well, and keeping... Uh, again, we're, we'll be getting to that a little bit more later as far as how the background is going to work. The, thing, the key thing being, if they weren't public, you would have to set them in code because they wouldn't be available in the inspector. And you wouldn't be able to monkey with the settings during play. Uh, yes, break very shortly. We just need to fill in a little bit of code. Um, I figure that if we do a break um, after I get in a bunch of code written, that'll give people mm. a lot of time to copy it down if they need it. And the code that's going to be written will do some fun stuff, and fun stuff is always good. Okay, so it looks like everybody's ready. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to jump into a file. I'm going to jump into one of our states. I'm going to jump into the playing game state. And the playing game state is going to scroll the background. So I'm going to go ahead and on my update method, just to keep the update method a little bit cleaner, I'm going to create a auxiliary method. Um, typically on my update methods, I will have uh, a variety of these little sub methods within the update. The only reason I'm not doing it for this code is this code is really just in here for testing purposes. It's going to be nuked very shortly. So the scroll background method, what the scroll background method is going to do is it's going to scroll the background. So it's going to loop through all of the segments in manager.segments. And for every segment... Done it again with... What? You what? You're going to loop through every segments in manager.segments. You, know, you did that earlier. I did do that earlier. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to loop through every segment in segments, and I'm going to translate them in the Z direction by background jump 
or background scroll c speed multiplied by time dot delta time. Then I'm going to say if segment transform position z is smaller or greater than equal or start smaller or equal to manager uh, background jump point, then I'm going to say segment transform translate zero zero and then manager background jump size. So of course that's not going to work because I needed a public or a translate, not transform. Okay, so now if I go ahead and jump back into Unity and run this code, we'll get some fun behavior. Oh, look at that. Let me go ahead and bring the it's scroll speed moving. up to like 400. And just to make it, uh, well, slow it down a little bit from there. This is silly. For the frame, frame rate, please. All right, leave it about there and select one of the segments just to make it clear what's happening here. So, so Florin, that, that hopefully will answer your question at least as to why we've got two segments. Once one has gone far enough to get off the screen, it jumps to the other end of the queue and starts coming forward again. And this will carry on forever until your power, <laughs> until the world's energy supply is used up. This will continue. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause this, uh, jump into the code, copy this code down. Remember, I'm in the playing game state class, and I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. All right, and we're back. So the next thing we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to set up our camera and talk really briefly about camera settings. So I'm going to go ahead and select the main camera, and I already have some values in mind. So I'm going to set it up to a position of X10, Y15, Z negative 10. The rotation is going to be 45 in the X axis, 315 in the Y axis, and 0 in the Z axis. Now if I go ahead and hit play, can anybody tell me why there is a little bit of blue on the top right of my screen? Ooh, someone got it right. Yep. Perfect. Our far clipping plane is set too low. So I'm simply going to add, multiply it by 10 and get a nice little nice little sizable frush drum set up there and hit play again now. and you'll notice that it's black now is everyone is there anyone here who doesn't understand what that means in fact if you bring the far clipping plane down to 100 nelson right actually i'm going to go ahead and just click and drag it watch what happens in the game scene as i move the far clipping plane down See what happens? It is because it's that isn't the space at the end of the tube. That is not, says Paul, that is not the space at the end of the tube. That is literally, your camera can only see a certain distance. Beyond that distance, even if there is anything there, it will not be displayed. That blue that is there is the background color that is set in the camera component there is traditionally set to, ma to magenta. So although that looks like he's sliding the, uh, um, the cylinder back and forth, what that is actually is a slice through. He's slice essentially slicing off the back parallel to the camera. Yep. So if you look at the scene and watch, watch what happens with the scene view. In fact, if you can look look at the camera from the side, in the scene view, Nelson. Look at the what? Rotate the scene view so that you're looking side on to the camera, Frustum. Well, that'd be zooming in rather than rotating. But yeah, there we go. And then zoom out again. It'll make it clearer what's happening. Yep. 
As far as what a frustrum is, a frustrum is just a frustum. Frustum is just a pyramid with the top cut off. So notice if I bring the near clipping plane down. Notice how I get that little pyramid shape. Trapezoid. <coughs> um. <laughs> got a name. <laughs> Actually, no, that doesn't bother me nearly as much as frustum does. Frustrum, rather, because it should be frustum. Um, but yes. So, but did that little thumbnail sketch explain, get the point across there? Because it is quite a key mm -hmm. thing to know about generally when you're dealing with 3D space and cameras. Uh, is clipping plane adjusted, used for optimization? Yes, it is. Yeah, because obviously if you've got a massive uh, level with loads of things going on um, all around you, like Skyrim for instance, if you go into the into your set into your game settings in Skyrim, it's got uh, settings which are actually <coughs> essentially affect this for for view distance and things like that. And it will literally beyond that distance, it won't even calculate what's going on. Right. Otherwise, you'd have to calculate everything everywhere. And a few people have asked why 315. Um, subtract 315 from 360. That rotation, and in fact, I had to actually enter it in as a rotation of 45 and minus 45, but uh, Unity corrects so that you only rotate positive under circumstances. But again, that's just so you're pointing. Rotation works around the related axis. So you're rotating 45 degrees downwards, which is around the x axis, and you're rotating. Uh, 45 degrees backwards around Y, so anti-clockwise around Y axis. All right, we do have to get moving forward. Let's go ahead and create a gate prefab. So, what I'm going to go ahead and do is um, I'm going to jump into. I'm actually going to go ahead and pause. Do you okay. want to show that little um, what I mentioned about the crease? The, the crease crack. Yeah, notice when I hit play, I changed the background of my. Um, I can't really, it's hard to see. I saw it, funnily enough, I could see it just there when it was in motion. Yeah. Because I changed the there background of my camera, you'll see this little crease where our backgrounds are merging together. But you really Basically, want. Basically, this is. This comes down to the fact that the the cylinder that we've got, the, they are infinitely thin, single-sided faces that could never exist in nature. For more for more about that, check out the uh, uh, modeling videos, the blender videos, because that is discussed in that. Um, but um, where two butt up against each other, there's no thickness there or, or anything like that to uh, sort of for them to, there's literally just a point in points in space where they meet, and because of the fact that you're looking at it from a particular angle, and literally down to the pixel by pixel aliasing on a screen, and lo and floating point errors in calculation, you aren't going to get that um, occurring. It, that is just in yeah. the nature of the beast. Obviously, to solve it, uh, make your background black. Right. But it's good to have your background not black uh, while you're working on it so that you can see if there's any problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and create our gates. So I'm going to jump down into meshes. I'm going to click on our quad section, and I'm going to bring a quad section out into the world. Then I'm going to position it at 0, 0, 0, and then I'm going to frame up on it, or attempt to frame up on it. There we Your go. Your mouse pointer needs to be in. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is this particular thing um, is this has this model again uh, was thrown together very quickly, so I'm just going to sort of eyeball the dimensions. And I'm basically going to use this quad section to build um, a gate out of by simply manipulating the transforms. 
of four d different parts. So I'm going to start with duplicating the quad section. I'm going to move it over and then I'm going to rotate it. And then I'm going to move it up or sorry, in this case I'm going to move it down and get it nice and snug up against this little doohickey thing right there. Uh, that doesn't quite... Again, I'm just sort of eyeballing this as best as I can. I'm going to I blame the modeler. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and duplicate it again and dupl move it up like that. Position it right there. And that looks nice. So then I'm going to duplicate it. Cookie for anyone who can guess what the last step will be. Yeah. Pretty much just what you would expect. Okay, so it's not perfect, but for our purposes, these gates will work just fine. So now that I have this gate set up, I'm going to create an empty game object. And I'm going to call this empty game object gate. Then I'm going to make sure that the position of gate is at 0, 0, 0. And then I'm going to parent all of these quad sections to the gate so that now we have a single game object that ha that brings together this entire little gate guy doohickey thing. I'm going to go ahead and make sure he's positioned back at 0, 0, 0. I'm going to create a new folder in the project called prefabs. I'm going to click and drag the gate into the prefabs folder to create a prefab. So now we have an instantiatable um, object called gate that is simply a collection of four different models that we can instantiate multiple times to build our level. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit everybody's reset. Go ahead and hit one more minute if you're still working on it. Probably want to pause for a second while people do that. Yeah, and we're back. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we have a gate. Let's get the gate moving and let's set up a light. So I'm going to go ahead and jump out of my ortho view. Actually, then I'm going to jump back into an ortho view. What I'm going to go ahead and do this time. is I'm going to go ahead and grab our gate, jump into the move gizmo, move it forward in front of our camera a little bit. And then I'm going to duplicate it and move it forward again, duplicate it, move it forward again, and just so on. Then I'm going to take all of these gates and I'm going to dump them underneath segment one. By dumping the gates underneath segment one, we will now get some movement going with these gates. These gates will mean? now move forward. It means you're going to parent them to segment one. Yep. Okay, so finally, the last bit before I go ahead and hit play is I'm going to add a light. So I'm going to go into game object, create other... I'm going to create a directional light, and I'm going to give it a few specific properties. I'm going to give it a intensity of 0.5 and a color of white. So when I said I'm going to give it a few properties, I meant I was going to leave it to the default. I was actually looking at the um, when we were when you were going through this earlier. Uh, I'd recommend setting that intensity up to about two. Or well, maybe for now, but when we get into the player stuff, mm. there will be some uh, yeah, yeah. some concerns about that. Okay, so now that we have that set up, if I go ahead and hit play. Boom. And also, in terms of uh, spacing along Z, these want to be about 50 units right. apart. And, oh, as Nelson was just about to point out, the actual scroll speed... Okay, and then as far as the scroll speed, I'm going to go into my game manager, and I'm going to set the scroll speed, the background scroll speed, to 10. And now when I hit play, we have some moving gates. Sweet. Yay. I might say, spread them out so that they come marching past in a fairly sensible pace. And, you know, you can have fun with that. You can <laughs> move them up, down, left, right, wherever you want. Alrighty, so welcome to Module 4, the player. <laughs> Um, let's go ahead and get a player working um, and moving around on the screen. So, what I'm cool. going to go ahead and do is I'm going to take the player ship and I'm going to drag him over into the scene. 
and I'm going to set them up at 0, 0, 0 with a rotation of 0, 0, 0. So now if I jump into the player, I'll have a nice little player object right there. I'm going to rename the game object just player instead of player ship. And that's just, you know, up to you. Now I'm going to go ahead and create a material for the player ship. So that's the same process that we did with the star field. I'm going to click on the materials folder, go to create, go to material, and type in ship. I'm going to leave the ship material with the diffuse, diffuse shader, because that's the shader that we want. And then I'm going to attach the simple ship texture to the texture. I did that by opening up textures in my project and clicking and dragging on simple ship and dumping it right into this little texture field. Alternatively, you could cl click on the select button and navigate directly to simple ship. Now that we have this material created, I'm going to click and drag it and place it right onto our ship. So now our ship has this nice little shader on it. So now when I hit play, we have a ship that looks like it's flying, when, when in fact it's actually standing still. So go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and reset everybody's ready. Tell me when you have the ship created, the ship material created, and the ship material applied. You're going to pause. Um, maybe. Uh, directional light, I kept all the directional light settings default, by the way. Well, no, except for the intensity. I moved the intensity up to two. Okay. So. And actually, that will, I'll have to mention that to you now on video then. The, um, if you, because you're concerned about the brightness on the player ship, aren't you? It's actually going to be the brightness the of light. the light from the player ship. Yeah, if you, well, the light from, the directional light that's there at the moment, is that what, because it, is that what you're concerned about? Yeah, because what it what it does is it saturates everything so much. Yeah, if you um, what you can do to combat that is to bring the color down on the player ship. It just occurred to me you could actually do it that way. The reason I suggested in intensifying it was purely to get the stars to kick a bit more. Right. But I just wanted to mention that it just occurred to me then when you were setting up the material. Right. Now we're back. Let's go ahead and get player movement working. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into Visual Studio, and I'm going to create a... Actually, I'm going to jump into my game manager and add in some properties to our fields to the game manager that we're going to need in order to get the player to move forward right properly, or get the move player to be able to move properly. So I'm going to add a player speed lateral. And then I'm going to go ahead and say public um, float dead zone. And I'm going to use the dead zone to determine if, um, um, well, everybody should know what a dead zone is. <laughs> it's for the, uh, it's for uh, game pads um, so that things aren't too sensitive, I suppose you could say. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into scripts and add a player script. Uh, Wiley, yes, I know, but you what? It's still spelled lateral wrong. Okay, so the player script is going to go ahead and grab the game, ma the game manager script when he started. And then, during update, he's going to go ahead and calculate his movement. So his movement is simply going to be... Um, we're going to do two things. First of all, we're going to get the horizontal axis. And while I'm typing this out, do you want to talk about what axes are, Gavin? Um, oh, in this specific yeah. case, uh, uh, they they refer to things that you set up over in Unity in the uh, input settings, which 
I can't really um, go to uh, any more specifically while you're right without actually being over in Unity. But um, basically, these axes are set up as um, a, they're almost like definitions in C++ or um, how would you describe it, Jason? You wouldn't. Um, um, well, you, the important thing to realize about axes, though, is that they it's a level of abstraction, meaning that when you're playing with a game controller you'll, or a joystick, that will go into uh, to determining the axis data. Or, if you're playing with a keyboard, both the WASD and the arrow keys will go into determining axis data. And yeah, we saw that uh, in week one, whereby you can't use um, get axis horizontal and vertical in the Pong game that you set up because, like Nelson just said, W and the up arrow on your keyboard will both trigger this uh, get axis in, uh, in, in the vertical direction. Similar, and obviously all the other keys similarly. Um, it's a shorthand way that is set up for assigning hotkeys via, and you can you can add your own axes um, over in the inspector in Unity. Uh, are you going to show that or not? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. You jump into your um, your different uh, settings. input settings. Project settings. Which, for some reason, I can't remember where they are. There you go. Input. And then, so now you can change the uh, you can change the size of this array and set up the different axes. And you can, yes, yes, again, going into the ins and outs of what's going on behind here is beyond the scope of this course. But it should be fairly self-explanatory, at least in terms of basically you're coming up with a name that you're going to refer to an axis as. And then you, if you just stay on one of them for a minute, yeah, that'll do. Um, you can give it a name, um, and then assign negative and positive buttons. Uh, there we go, dead zone. In fact, you could have referred to that. Um, sensitivity and, and all these uh, other settings. And again, if you want to know more about what's going on behind the scenes of that, uh, the Unity scripting reference is the place to go and look, I believe. Okay, so we're just going to race through uh, the rest of the stuff that we have. Um, so, um, yeah. So what, now that we have a player script, I'm going to go ahead and attach it to the player. So... I'm going to go ahead and go into codes, uh, scripts, drag and drop player onto player. Then underneath game manager, I'm going to go ahead and set up his new player um, uh, information. I'm going to give us player speed lateral of 16 and a dead zone of 0 0.001. And then I'm going to play and see what happens. Player speed lateral. Okay, so really quick, um, you know, if you want to look at the player script, we do have a lot of more, a lot of more, a lot of other stuff that I wanted to get through, uh, and that's going to require a lot of, um, a lot of clicking around on stuff. So, um, if people want to continue to stay caught up, you're more than welcome to. But we're going to have to cut down on uh, the, the waiting for people to catch up uh, as we go along. In order, just simply in order to get things done, because we're oh, we're, in, we're at the two-hour mark now. Yep. Already. Okay. Um, the last. Thing yeah. So, if you if you've been, I'm afraid you will have to just go back and watch the videos if you do end up getting left behind. But we, we just haven't got the time to. Right. To to um, stay here for another few hours. The last thing I'm going to do is to make this game a little bit more interesting for being able to fly through gates, I'm going to add a uh, spotlight onto the player by going up to Game Object, Create Other, and add in a spotlight. And then the spotlight I'm going to position at 0, 0, 0 with a rotation of 0, 0, 0. And then I'm going to click and drag it onto the player. 
Now there's a few other properties I'm going to add to the spotlight to make it a little bit easier to see. I'm going to go ahead and set its color to red. I'm going to set its intensity to, I'm going to keep that at 1, but I'm going to set, set the spot angle to 54. And then I'm going to go ahead and set its range to 20. Next, I'm going to go ahead and we'll talk about lighting a little bit next week. I'm going to bring down the intensity of the main light to 0.5 just so that we can get some, we can actually see our redness a little bit easier. But now, as I fly through, you'll notice that we have this little faint spotlight that's a little bit fainter than I had intended it for it to be. But you can kind of see that as we fly through, it's a little bit easier to guide our ship through each one of the gates now that there's some little bit more information. Um, and then I can bring the spotlight a little bit forward in Z as well to, um, to get a little bit more range out of it. That should also stop it reflecting off the uh, inside of the yeah. front of the, of the ship model. Okay, so that's about it with the player. The last thing that we're going to cover today are the is collision. We'll have a little bit more of an in-depth discussion of collision later on. There are a lot of really complicated rules about how the Unity physics engine deals with collision. But for now what we're going to do is we're just going to take some stuff for granted and we'll get some basic, the most basic form of collision detection set up on all of our objects. Now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go I'm going to go into our gate prefab and I'm going to give each one of these quad sections a box collider. Now, a collider is the object that a component for a game object that's responsible for determining if another object has collided with it. Seems pretty straightforward. Are you going to do this uh, are you going to nuke all the other ones and then No, I'm just going to use the apply. Them. That's probably going to be the easier. Oh, okay. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is underneath each quad section, I'm going to add a box collider. So for this quad section, I'm going to say component physics box collider. This quad section, component physics box collider. This quad section, component physics box collider. This quad section, component physics box collider. So now each one of these individual sections has a box collider. Now I'm going to go ahead and give the gate a rigid body. And the reason I'm going to go ahead and do that is so that it can participate in the physics uh, engine calculation for determining if something has collided with something. So to do that, I'm going to... Now note, he's doing this to the gate, whereas what he added the boxes to the quad sections. He added the box colliders, rather, to the, to the quad sections themselves. But this goes on the gate. Yep. So to add the rigid body, I'm going to click on gate, go to component, physics and add in rigid body. Now these in settings are very important. I do not want the gates to use gravity because that's well kind of they would just show them fall. <laughs> but I do want to check this option. What this does is it get, it makes it so that um, we as the developer get to determine the transform of this object without the transform of the object having to go through the different force calculations that uh, it normally would. So typically when working with rigid bodies, you have to tell it, okay, I want to add a force here, I want to add a force there, and so on. But by setting that option right there, what we get is the ability to set the transform of this object manually, which is exactly what we want. The final thing that I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to set the, actually I'm going to do two more things. I'm going to set the box collider um, is trigger property to true on each one of our quad sections. Now, remember, like I said before, the, is, the, the collision detection in Unity is a big topic, and there's a lot of different rules about what collides with what, who gets what messages, and so on. And we will, when we have time to make, have that discussion, we will definitely will. But for now, every one of these settings is absolutely vital to getting Unity to properly determine when some option has collided with another option or when some, well, I just read the questions panel, when some uh, object has collided with another object. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to do is inside of the gate, I'm going to say game object create empty, and I'm going to drag that game on, well, first of course I'm going to set it to zero, zero, zero. And then 
I'm going to drag it into, well, actually I'm going to wait on this one. And the reason is, is because I want my gate to be positioned at 0, 0, 0 as well while I parent this up and set it up. So I'm going to move the gate itself to 0, 0, 0. And then I'm going to frame up on it. So now we're back at the origin and I can go ahead and do my parenting properly. So if I click on this game object that I just created, I'm going to click and drag it into the gate. So now there's a new empty game object within gate. I'm going to rename this goal. Goal is going to be nothing but a box collider. So I'm going to go into component, physics, and box collider. And I'm going to go ahead and just eyeball this. What the goal is, is it's an object, a box collider, that will trigger when the player has cleared the gate. So we wanted to encompass the entirety of the gate, but there's another important thing that we'll have to keep in mind, and that is we want to position in the x in the x axis axis, we want to position it at the end of the gate. Z axis. Z axis. We want to position it at the end of the gate so that the um, the box collider will only trigger when the player reaches the end of the gate. <laughs> the way I like to put it, the player has a chance to crash into the gate before reaching the box collider. Right. Then, of course, I'm going to set the is trigger property to true. Finally, now that I've set up my, the gate the way I want it to, I'm going to hit the apply button. And by hitting the apply button, I've applied all of these changes to each one of the prefabs that share this object, or uh, each one of the objects that share this prefab inside our entire game. So now all the settings... And in, you what? I was going to say, and indeed to the prefab itself. Yeah. So if I jump down into the prefab under my prefabs folder, you'll see we now have a goal and all our box colliders and everything is awesome. Okay, so the next thing we're going to go, go, want to go ahead and do is work with our player a little bit. The player is going to need to have a collider to collide with the other colliders. I mean, that should be fairly straightforward. So I'm going to go ahead and give the player a physics component called box collider. And that's just going to be a very simple approximation based off the edges of our mesh. Finally, I'm going to give the box collider within player a trigger property. So now that we have all of this collision stuff set up, what can we do with it? Well, by doing that, we've opened up the possibility of using a few different magical methods on our mono behaviors. So if I jump into player.cs, I can now add a new magic method to it. And I'm going to go ahead and call that public void on trigger enter that takes in a collider. Now remember what I mean by magic methods. These are methods that are not over uh, overload or overrides of uh, methods on the mono behavior class, nor are they implementations of an interface. They are just methods that are named in a particular way that get picked up by Unity via reflection. So now that we have our on trigger inner method, I can go ahead and prove that we run into stuff by deep doing debug.log ran into something. Now if I jump back into my game and watch my console, I can now prove that we can indeed run into something. If you actually run into something. Yep. So you see I ran into my goal and yeah, said yeah. ran into something. And if I run into the edge, I also ran into, well, actually quite a few things in that case. But we'll get to fixing that. So the last bit... Um, for our logic at this point is going to be to um, deal with collision in a fairly elegant way. So what happens if you hit a, the edge of a gate, I want the player to be destroyed and a player to lose a life. And when he hits a goal, I want his points to increase. So I'm going to jump into the player and I'm going to introduce a very basic abstraction. I'm going to go ahead and create an interface called iGameEntity that is notified when a player is collided with them. 
so I'll say void collide um, game, or sorry, player, player. Now the reason I'm introducing this nice little interface is to make dealing with the collisions a little bit more straightforward, as opposed to having to manually put up a bunch of on trigger enter blah 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 boilerplate code every time we want a mono behavior that can interact with the player. I want the player to instead do the calc to determine if he hits something that implements this interface and then notifies that object. This is literally like a this is like a name tag that we've set up via code where we've literally slapped it on him and said this is something that you need to look out for and the player will now be able to spot it and recognize it however you might have other things this often happens in games where you're running around in grass for instance obviously you don't collide with all the yeah. particulate grass and plants and <laughs> butterflies and atmospheric dust in the air none of those things would need in this case uh, the, the uh, eye game entity thing. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write code that determines if the if we've collided with something that implements the interface and if we do we will invoke that method. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say if not game object active return. I don't want any collisions to happen when our game object isn't active and occasionally I run into situations where they did. So by adding that check in there we ensure that we won't have that happen. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say for each var entity in collided with dot game object. Collided with dot game object is a game object that, well, we collided with. And it's provided by the collider that was provided by Unity as a parameter to this magic method. So I'm going to do game object dot get components of mono behavior. Then I'm going to say of type. And I'm going to bring in I game entity. So by doing this, I'm saying for every mono behavior on the game object, if that mono behavior in implements this interface, return it. And then I'm going to say entity dot collide, collided with, or sorry, this. It might, just for clarity, temporarily be worth breaking out that line 30 into a variable. Well, yeah, so I mean, I can go and say um, all mono behaviors, and then I can say will behave was. All behaviors that implement a game entity. I do find for explanation it's, it's clearer to do it that way, I think. So, straightforward method that just goes through queries all the mono behaviors that are attached to a game object that it collided with, determines if they implement this interface, and then informs those other objects that they need to go ahead and do something. And what I'm going to have them do is on my, um, I'm going to go ahead, actually first of all I'm going to go ahead and create a method on our player that we can reuse to destroy the player. So, destroy. so I'm going to say public void destroy player. Destroy player is going to start what's called in coroutine. We'll get into coroutines. Someone. <laughs> now, probably next week. But uh, just keep in mind that um, they're one of those things that ordinarily would be classed as a more of an intermediate. Con but not so much the concept is very straightforward. These are things that just go off by themselves and do stuff without holding up the main program. But the, the nitty gritty, the ins and outs of it are quite a bit more advanced. This is so this is one of the difficulties I, I find with. Um, with this early on, which is, this is actually an incredibly useful little way of doing things like this uh, with minimal coding. But the act, what's going on behind the scenes is complicated, but you don't need to know about all of that in order to get the use out of it. But I hate just saying, <laughs> you know, take it on trust, this works. But, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into it next week. Um, basically, a coroutine allows you to pause the execution of a method if you wanted to. So when we destroy a player, I start a coroutine called destroy ship co. Destroy ship co sets the position of the player to um, the origin, sets the player and all of the player's children to be inactive, waits for 1.5 seconds, and then reactivates the player and all of his children. That's what the recursively part means. It, goes, it recurses. Oh, yes. This is. Welcome to English. This is, it recurses through each of the children. Mm -hmm. And children's children and so forth. And does it all to those as well. Yep. So now we have our player, shi uh, player um, ship script where we can go ahead and destroy him if we want to, and we can also collide with him. So now we need a gate and a goal. So I'm going to go ahead and create a uh, gate script, which is going to implement mono behavior, and he's, or inherit from mono behavior, and implement iGame entity. By implementing iGame entity, I'm forced to write a method called collide. Well, what's Collide going to do? For right now, I'm simply going to say debug log player lost points and died. And then I'm going to say player dot destroy player. Then I'm going to go ahead and create another script called goal. And goal is, of course, going to be a mono behavior. It's also going to implement iGame entity and run this code and whenever he collides with the player I'm going to simply say debug log out player got points and that's even patoons. really about yes. it so now jumping back into unity I can apply the um, different scripts I just wrote to the prefab of gate and then uh, reapply all the settings from gate to all the other instantiated prefabs so if I jump into that, well, actually, you I, I believe if you go over into the pre into your project view and do it there instead, it should just propagate down. Although it's worth it's always worth checking when you do that. I will say because sometimes it probably not nowadays, but in the past I've known it to be f finicky sometimes. All right. So um, yeah. So if I go ahead and in here and I jump into my code scripts. I can move my gate script onto each one of my quad sections. Keep in mind that the quad sections are what I want to have considered to be the things that you run into to have your ship well destroyed. So I'm going to move gate onto each one of our quad sections. And then I'm going to move goal onto goal. And so now to verify, you'll notice that all the scripts are indeed applied on each one of the objects in the hierarchy. So now when I go ahead and hit run, I should get the appropriate debug logs out depending on what happened. So notice if I hit the edge of the goal, it says player lost points and died, player lost points and died, blah, blah, blah. But if I manage to get it into one of the goals, I will get a different message entirely. So at this point, Yay. by filling out either one of the methods on both the goal script and in the gate, uh, gate script, you can pretty much do all, all the game logic you need to do to make this game, well, work, as in adding points and removing lives. So right now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to write just a little bit more code to get uh, the concept of points going, and then just leave it at that. I agree with what both Wick and Flash has said over in BuzzNet, by the way. Uh, basically, we got to a point where we couldn't add another week to the class. We've got a lot more content to get through, and the problem is if we if we stop for long periods of time for a handful of people um, and then just keep adding a week to the end each time, this is going to end up being a 14-week course. So at this point, for those that can't keep up, it's not a problem. Just watch the video and try to concentrate on what's being said. You know, I promise you when you go back and watch the video again and follow along, it'll have a nice impact. 
way more yeah, than I, just saying, oh, it's too fast. I, I can't even, I can't keep up, so I'm just going to disconnect. Uh, it all comes down to how much you value the education you're trying to get from this. If you really seriously want to learn this stuff, kick back, pay close attention to what's being said. In case something's said that you don't understand, and if that happens, ask a question. Um, otherwise, try to let it absorb and then go back to the video and treat it like homework. You know, go back through it and actually follow because then you can pause and type out exactly what was said. And Kagadomi nailed it. He said it's like trying to do math homework, although he missed an S off. It's like trying to do maths homework during the lecture. You know, it's, you can't, it, it, some people can do that. <laughs> some people can multitask. I'm, for one, can't. And I actually, literally, I was, due to my internet situation, a different computer to Visual Studio when I first started doing a Hyperion project. I used to have to write down the code by hand on a pad of paper and bring it out to my shed and type it up. And you learn more doing that. It's, you do. It's... Uh, but anyway, yes, we're now taking up time explaining why we can't take up time. So, <laughs> No, I just got a few, a tiny little bit more to go ahead and put together. <clears throat> for, for the gates, all I'm going to go at, or for the goals, all I'm going to do is I'm going to do a public void start, pretty much going to do what we did with the player. So I'm going to say manager equals game object, find game manager, get component, game manager uh, generate a nice little field for us and then when we collide I want to say player points plus plus I'm going to go ahead and create a property a int property on our um, game manager called player points so now the game manager class has a public int player points property which with uh, automatic property and whenever we collide with a goal, we get more points. Well, to make things a little bit more interesting, I could just say plus equals like 10 or something. That might be a little bit better. So now, instead of the playing game state, what I'm going to go ahead and do is on the render method, which remember, render is from or deferred from uh, the on GUI method. I'm going to say GUI dot label, and I'm going to position a label at 0, 0, 0320. And I'm going to say points is manager dot player points. And notice that those are curly brackets. Yes. Curly braces rather than uh, parentheses. Yep. So now if I jump back into Unity, points zero. But as I fly through a goal, we now have 10 points. We have 20 points. And of course, so far, this is the easiest game on the planet. Yes. Well, <laughs> he says just as Nelson loses. His, but yes, because... Uh, we can make this a little bit more interesting. Ooh. You're not going to hope. You're going to cr crash straight away. Oh, I got 20 points on that one. You're not going to come back quickly enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by fluke. Just because they're all lined up where you're going. Okay, stop playing the game. <clears throat> Well, that's kind of funny. Set it back to something sensible. And, well, yeah, but it's all very well and good, but you can't die properly. I mean, you die, but you don't die, die. Yeah, we're going to have to, we're, we're going to look at that for uh, next week, getting um, oh, the concept sorry, of... sorry, yes. I was, yeah, the, the... I was queuing you up for the wrong thing. <laughs> for the scenes and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but, yeah. So I think that just about wraps up what I wanted to get through today. Sorry about the last, you know, 20 yeah. minutes being really, really quick. But um, there was a lot of settings that were changed, and, yeah. We will, obviously, like I said, we'll be around after the video. For the, so for those of you who are actually here live, we'll, sh we'll, we'll be able to see all of the scripts again. Oh, I'm saying scripts now. Stop it. <laughs> this isn't good. But, yeah, uh, we, we, we do have some interesting places we would like to take this to as we travel forward into something that's just not jumping through gates like this, but we get into level construction with the Zaxxon style of game that we're going for. And that's where things are really going to get fun. But this is kind of getting past the 
um, the very beginner 101 stage. Again, remember from week number one, and I mentioned again on week number two, uh, week number one's homework was to go over the Unity fundamental videos so that we didn't have to stop and say, here's how to rotate, here's how to move, here's how to you know, change your viewport, etc. So it's just um, it's important that you watch those videos if you're not up to speed with that, but we would like to get to this other content in the 101 class. So yeah. Um, homework. No. Sir. Yep. Uh, well, yeah. Just like what um, or homework in this case is going to be. Hang, just hang on. Hang on. No, I, I'm still addressing questions because Flora just said feedback, basic parts, and I appreciate the feedback by the way. Uh, like rotate the gate, receive too much time whilst the interesting, and with questions from our side, was somewhat pushed aside. There were a lot of questions answered tonight. I don't clear my answer log like Gavin does. I can still go back to, and, and they get checked off as they're actually answered, and there are a lot of answered questions. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what you're, you're talking about. You see, the thing is, Florian, if you're you're well, hang, on one, hang on one second, Gavin, please. Um, if you're talking about questions that are being asked over in BuzzNet, remember, we're not responsible for those. We've, we've tried to say a million times, please put questions in the questions panel because we can't sit there and stare at BuzzNet. Uh, that's very important. Um, but I think at the point that the gates were being put in, we were hoping that people were going to be able to travel a little bit faster, and it wasn't too terribly long after the gates that we had to kind of start picking up speed more and more to get to the end of this. Um, so that's... And referring to the last 20 minutes. Yeah, the last 20 minutes, for we had to, or because Nelson actually sent me a message that you guys didn't see that said, we're going to push this back another week. We have a lot of interesting stuff that we can get to in this class, or we could just drop it and move the last 20 minutes to next week's class, or I could just ask you guys to watch the video. And personally, I'd rather ask you guys to watch the video so the content's there, and then you can come back and ask questions and then we can get to the really cool stuff starting next week, and as opposed to this last 20 minutes dragging that out over two hours next week. That's that's. I'm, I mean, I'm, I apologize that we disappointed you, that, but that's what I'm aiming for: us to get into some fun stuff in the 101 class. I, I have one spe one little thing to add specifically to that uh, to Florin as well. You're actually suffering from something that I did when I initially was first looking at this, which is you have to remember this is a 101. And you, I happen to know, because you've got a particularly noticeable name, have been through, well, pretty much all of the courses that we've done so far on programming, certainly the C-sharp. So it, you have to remember that what comes across... <laughs> Jason says this so much better than me. What comes across as simple to you, it's surprising what people need to ask about as well. Um, and yeah, but it, it, thanks for at least speaking. No, like, us feedback no as well. exactly. So I can, yeah, like I said, I appreciate the feedback, and at least allows me the opportunity. And this is why I really appreciate it. To to rather say, oh, you're right. I didn't think about that, or to respond with, here's why we kind of had to do it that way, um, because we've already lost wide a number of students that have had to go to bed so the numbers are starting to get really low and as both Gavin and Nelson said we're not hanging up the uh, conference right now we're just getting the class done but and, and we're still here so there's no difference for people that are saying I prefer um, slower speeds we're still here so now you can ask questions or say let me look at this script or look at that script but for those that had to go videos are now done and you can review and go from there. And Swin, right now, actually, the class is, no, I don't take offense to that, but you're basing that off your speed, not everyone's speed. And, and just so that that doesn't, his comment was right now, people could catch up on the code. We have some slow typers that you could give them the entire class and that maybe they get a method or two in. That's because, That's because I know some of you guys personally. I think he just meant if it was showing VS oh, rather than Unity talking. at the moment. Yeah, but by doing this, everybody but, has. Yeah. I have everybody um, full attention. Pardon? What? I said, but by doing this, I have everybody's full attention. Pardon? So, anyway, now, did you right. 
Did you go ahead and uh, end the uh, video? No, I'm, I will. Uh, <laughs> kind of jumped, you know, everything sort of, yeah. All right. well, I was just finishing off those uh, questions yeah. in the question panel and comments that had come in. All right, so to all the people watching the video, we'll... No, we haven't covered homework. Yeah, homework, re-implement this. That's what I was trying to tell you. Are you not doing the other thing? No. Next week. Okay. Yeah, next week. Okay, so, and so goodbye, people. Well, that's going to wrap up the class. Are you, were you going to talk <laughs> about homework? Huh? I just did talk about uh, Well, no, if it's, just, if it's just a question of it's get up to date with what has been covered yeah, just, in class. Yeah, just get, just get this complete so you have a ship that's flying through and you're making your points and the information's getting logged out. Alrighty, so we'll see all you guys next week. Or all the future Sweet. people next week. That's right. All right, all right bye.